It's a chilly November night back in 2020. A squid fishing factory vessel is bobbing up and down, miles off the coast. The clock reads just past midnight. The Peruvian horizon is faint in the distance, and Mohamed Agui Silmi and fellow crew members are working on a plan, a plan to escape. Mohamed never imagined himself being in this position, out in the water, alone, without any family or friends to help him. He is from a low-income community of Java, Indonesia, where most people work as farmers, making just a few thousand dollars for the entire year. He'd been lured to the ship with a promise of decent pay and steady work. His two-year contract called for him to work on a Chinese squid fishing vessel called the Lu Ching Yuang Yu 277. It sounded like a great opportunity. He knew it was going to be tough, but he had no idea how brutal things could get. It's harder and more exhausting on sea rather than on land. There were times during squid season that we had to work 18 hours or even 22 hours. We only had two hours of rest to wake up work again, and repeat the transfer, just like that. Mohammed was one of 25 crew members on the Lu Ching Yuang Yu 277. The captain and 14 others were Chinese. Mohammed and the rest were Indonesian. But it was clear from the beginning the Indonesians were second class. The food aboard the ship was Chinese. Most had pork in it, so it was not halal. This meant that Muhammad and the other Muslims' only option was to eat rice after their long and grueling shifts. But what's worse, they would not set foot on land for the majority of their contract, traveling more than 11,000 miles away from home, to the waters of the coast of Peru. And while on board, Muhammad was completely cut off from friends and family. The Chinese vessel didn't birth for almost 16 months. And then, one night, disaster struck. Literally, another fishing vessel accidentally rammed them. The boat was hit from the back. Then we anchored in the Peru Ocean. It takes more than two months to repair the vessel. My friends asked permission from the captain to return home, but he didn't allow us to return. Mohammed was stuck halfway around the world on a badly damaged ship, unable to move. His contract wouldn't be up for another eight months. Mohammed felt imprisoned. He couldn't take it anymore. So one night, Mohammed and four other members of the crew decided they needed to escape. They were going to jump. It was a 17-foot drop down from the deck to the water. Even though it was nighttime, the horizon was still visible. The plan was to try to swim to shore. Actually, the land looks very close, so I dared to jump off in secret. But then, it was still so far away that even after one hour in the water, we weren't even close. With the shore still looming in the distance, Mohammed began to worry. The water was cold, and though he was a good swimmer, some of the others were struggling to keep up. They were wearing life preservers, but were being weighed down by their belongings. The Lu Ching Yuan Yu 277 sent out a lifeboat to retrieve the fishermen, and despite their predicament, they refused to go back. We will not go back to the vessel. We just wanted to return home, and that's it. So the Indonesians began treading water, hoping someone else would rescue them. An hour later, a boat from Peruvian authorities found them and offered to take them back to their ship. But once again, Mohammed and the others refused. I said that I don't want to go back on that vessel. I just wanted to go home. We met Mohammed through the Environmental Justice Foundation, 
a human rights organization based in the UK. Their research shows that 85% of Indonesian crew members on these types of Chinese vessels have reported abusive living or working conditions. A majority had also seen or experienced physical violence. And this is the problem. Out on the high seas, there's little law enforcement to protect fishermen like Mohammed and little to no enforcement of fishing regulations. But that doesn't mean people aren't trying. I'm Ruxandra Guidi, and you're listening to The Catch, a special six-part series from Foreign Policy in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation. We're tracking squid as it makes its way from ocean to plate. Today, part four, the high seas. In our last episode, we saw how squid has been an economic boon for wholesalers in Peru and others in the global fishing industry. We also heard about the challenges faced by those who want to study and regulate fishing to help ensure its sustainability. In Peru, at least, the problem is too few laws and too little enforcement. There's no point in having laws if if the laws aren't going to be enforced. This is Peter Hammerstedt, a captain at Sea Shepherd, an environmental group founded in 1979. Sea Shepherd has taken what it calls a more proactive approach toward curbing illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, also known as IUU fishing. This distinguishes them from Greenpeace, the group that for decades has grabbed headlines in their efforts to protect the oceans. I grew up hearing about the Rainbow Warrior, Greenpeace's large sailing ship that was used to protest whaling operations, nuclear tests, and factory boats, like the one Mohammed was working on when he was rescued off the coast of Peru. It turns out Sea Shepherd's founder, Paul Watson, had been in Greenpeace before he decided that model needed to be taken one step further. In order to really protect the oceans, he felt they needed to become cops, or cop-adjacent. When there's a law enforcement vacuum, when state actors are not upholding the laws that exist, then civil society, organizations like Sea Shepherd, have to fill that law enforcement void. Nowadays, the organization has a fleet of four ships and several smaller boats. Their logo features a skull on top of a trident in a shepherd's crook, crossbone style. The group's vessels patrol the high seas in areas as disparate as the coast of West Africa, South America, and even the Antarctic. They use satellite imagery to track the speed and direction of the ship. Squid fishing is done at night using bright lights, since that's when the squid feed, and that makes those vessels easy to spot. So we're oftentimes in the border areas looking to see which vessels are moving at fishing speed and crossing uh, the boundary between the two countries. If a suspicious vessel flees, They chase after them. And then we jet off as quickly as possible to intercept that ship. They'll do everything but the actual bust. They leave that to their partners, local law enforcement. The Navy Coast Guard personnel scramble onto the deck of the vessel. They secure the bridge. They ensure that all the crew are mustered. And then an inspection begins. Once Sea Shepherd is cleared to go aboard, they'll begin their inspection in order to build a criminal case. They'll go through the vessel's official logbook, inspect cargo spaces and gear, and determine whether the vessel has the appropriate license to fish. Sometimes they'll even uncover an unofficial logbook which keeps track of what they're actually catching and want to hide from authorities. Sea Shepherd's track record for stopping illegal fishing vessels is impressive. They've been involved in dozens of busts, saving millions of fish. The most memorable one involved tracking one ship for thousands of miles. The ship was part of a fleet known as the Bandit Six. The Bandit Six, as they were known back in 2004, were a fleet of six Spanish fishing vessels out to capture Patagonian toothfish, or when it served on your plate, the more palatable moniker, Chilean sea bass. The white, flaky fish became a delicacy at fine restaurants selling for more than $30 a plate in the U.S. Consequently, it became a prime target for poachers, 
About 20 years ago, the poaching of Patagonian and Antarctic toothfish down in the Southern Ocean was so extensive that one out of three fish was caught illegally. There were about 70 vessels that were poaching fish down at really the, the end of the world. Uh, because of government action from the United States, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, many of these vessels were brought to justice, but six remained. Uh, six vessels that evaded justice, that evaded law enforcement. These six vessels, the Bandit Six, they would wind up on Interpol's most wanted list, making $60 million in illicit profit over 10 years. And they did everything they could to evade capture from local law enforcement. As soon as that surveillance plane was over the horizon, the ship would already be repainting itself and putting a new nameplate on. But it didn't stop there. Boats in international waters are required to fly what are known as flags of convenience, which identify the country where the vessel is registered. Bandit 6 seemingly had more flags than a UN convention, hoisting up whichever ones were most advantageous to them at any given time. Peter and Sea Shepherd were determined to stop them. The idea was that I would bring down my ship, the Bob Barker, to the Antarctic. I would find one of these ships, in particular a ship called the Thunder, wanted by the International Criminal Police Organization on several international blacklists. And the idea was that if, if I could find this ship, then I could tell law enforcement where it was. So he came up with a simple yet ingenious plan. Never let the rogue vessel out of sight. And as long as we were following this ship, they couldn't repaint and they couldn't change their name. Again, Sea Shepherd does not have the authority to make an arrest, but what they can do is make it much harder for poachers to continue fishing illegally. And they weren't shy about being aggressive. They knew that we would physically intervene as well to stop their illegal fishing activity, that we would physically block them, that we would pull up and confiscate their illegal nets if they put them out. Despite all this, the thunder would not relent. Days turned into weeks and eventually months. The crews of the ships navigated through ice flows, endured 50-foot swells and thrashing storms. At one point, the two ships, the Bob Barker and the Thunder, nearly collided. It was an epic chase, one that would become the longest pursuit of an illegal fishing vessel in history. We chased this ship across three oceans, covering 11,000 nautical miles and covering 110 days. Eventually, the crew aboard the Bob Barker found themselves in the Gulf of Guinea, off the coast of West Africa. The captain of the Thunder, unable to shake our pursuit, uh, made the ill-fated bid to sink his own ship to try to destroy the evidence on board. Sea Shepherd moved to save the 40 crew members, and then, once Interpol arrived on the scene, turned the Thunder over to law enforcement. Sea Shepherd captured the sinking for a documentary that was made about the chase. Yes, the distress is sinking. They're abandoning ship right now. We're putting a boat in the water to recover them. And news of the dramatic case made headlines all over the world, which is exactly what Hammerstedt was hoping for. Part of their strategy is not just to stop illegal fishing while it's happening, but also to bring attention to the practice and goad governments into action. The Australian crew of the Sea Shepherd have rescued the crew of what is believed to be an illegal fishing vessel. The captain of the Thunder, once ironically the Bob Barker rescued them, uh, seemed to, uh, I think it was pump his fist in the air or say yes in seeming joy that maybe it was all over. The crew of the Thunder has now been handed over to authorities in Sao May. So strong action, strong direct intervention, definitely has a result in, in motivating governments to actually do their jobs and, and to fulfill their responsibilities. Soon after, the other ships that made up the Bandit Six were running into legal trouble, too. Six months after that, another two ships were arrested in Cabo Verde. Another vessel was detained in Senegal. Another ship detained in Malaysia. And the Indonesian Navy intercepted the sixth of the Bandit Six and sank the vessel at sea after disembarking their crew. Of course, Sea Shepherd is just one environmental group trying to fill in the gaps where law enforcement doesn't have the time, energy, or the resources to patrol their own coastlines, much less the high seas. There are other groups like Global Fishing Watch, which use satellite imagery to track and report on the movement of ships. 
And then there's our next guest, who cares so deeply about the people whose livelihoods depend on healthy oceans, that she tracks these vessels in her spare time. I'm Dihia Belhabib, also called Dia. I am the principal investigator at Ecotrust Canada and director and co-founder of Nautical Crime Investigation Services. Most of Dihia Belhabib's work involves identifying bad actors from our home base in Vancouver. These are the industrial scale vessels that turn off their tracking devices, change their names, and change their flags to evade law enforcement. Just figuring out who the owner is can be difficult, as some of these vessels are shielded by layers of shell corporations. And so late at night, she scours the internet looking for clues using satellite data and port logs. She also taps into a global network of observers who input details about fishing vessels into a publicly shared database she created called Spyglass. Her aim is to expose criminals to local authorities. So people could research the criminal past to fishing vessels before granting them licenses. Dehia says her work to catch illegal fishers is driven not just by a desire to protect marine life, but also to protect the livelihoods of artisanal fishermen. She can actually pinpoint the very moment when she realized she wanted this to be her life's work. She was 21, working on getting an engineering degree in her native Algeria. Her master's thesis focused on the health of the local shrimp population, and as part of her research, she needed to interview fishermen working on trawlers about the size and scale of their catch. So she went to the port and waited for them to come ashore. I remember that very vividly. While she stood there, a lone fisherman caught her eye. He was wearing clothes typical of Mediterranean fishermen, dark blue jeans and a blue jacket. I remember his little beard, his little hat, his little his clothes, very where he was sitting, his his face, he was like he's tanned by the sun. Even though he wasn't part of her research, she decided to talk to him anyway. I approached him, said salam, which means, you know, peace, peace be upon you. I said salam, he said salam. And I thought that he would really judge me because I was literally the only woman there. And I was standing there and he was looking at me and he was like, so what are you doing here? And we started having a conversation. And it was kind of a reflex, you know, he pointed the finger to the ocean. I was like, do you see that trawler? Do you see that trawler? And I was like, yeah. He was like, that trawler is taking my fish away. I'm going home with no fish. I'm going home to my kids with no money, nothing today, because that guy took everything away from me. He's not supposed to fish that close. Everybody can see him. Nobody's doing anything because he can pay them off. And I could see tears in his eyes and it just like broke me. It was like, and yet I'm here studying the biology of shrimp. So how did that conversation and that awareness of this human face of of the environment really set you on the path that, that you know, you ended up on? That little experience was absolutely life-changing. It was a butterfly effect for me. So instead of going for a university uh, seeking a biology degree, I went for something where I could actually see that people were an integral part of an ecosystem, not only like the, you know, outsiders or predators only of that ecosystem. So I'm curious to hear what your philosophy then became on the possibility of finding that balance between livelihoods and protecting the oceans. Is that something that's still a work in progress or how do you feel about that possibility today? I would say whatever we're doing in terms of conservation, in terms of management in in nature and in the environment, if people's voices are not heard, including those voices that have been marginalized, those voices that have been criminalized, like the people that we perceive as criminals of nature, even those voices, if they're not heard, it's not going to work. It is going to fail. Any conservation strategy that we're trying to implement is going to fail. But one thing that I've learned in the in the recent years is this divide between community-driven agendas and conservation-driven agendas. I found out, for example, that those people that we call criminals, I've encountered fishermen that traffic drugs that have been criminalized. I've, I've talked with fishermen that have been, you know, fishing illegally that have been criminalized as well. Having conversations with them, meaningful conversations with them to understand the why is more important than any feasibility study of, you know, how to design a marine protected area, for example. Because that why really reveals the reason why people go 
commit such crimes in general? Why, how do they find themselves in that environment to begin with? And to address that is addressing the virus, not the symptom. Yeah, going back to that why, could you step back a little bit and in layman's terms, I- explain to us kind of like that landscape, what is driving illegal fishing around the world and, and why? The idea economists have introduced to us is that it's often greed. I want money, so I'm going to fish illegally because it's the easiest way for me to get fish. That is not necessarily true. Fishermen, for example, are driven by desperation. You know, when you realize that you're lacking access to your adjacent resources, which means that there is no more fish within your the waters that you're used to fish in, you are going to try something else. It's an act of desperation. And sometimes you have uh, basically poverty that pushes you to that. You have to make an income. You have no choice but to go fish despite like use maybe illegal gear, fish with enclosed areas, no matter what works, you need to do it for your survival. And obviously there is a sense of greed. I want to make money. And so I'm going to fish illegally, but we don't see that as much in what we call the small scale sector. So these communities, they have much stewardship and they have a sense of shaming for the people who do it for greed. So you don't see it that much. We see greed mostly for like big corporations and big boats than small uh, owner operated uh, operations. So I did want to ask you about some of these large vessels vis-a-vis small scale fishermen. Is it really just illegal fishing from international fleets that we as consumers should mostly worry about? Or should we also be concerned about fishing practices of these smaller uh, fishermen? Uh, We should be concerned about all of the above. The reason behind that is that the impacts on the ocean is... Not necessarily the same, obviously. The footprint of small-scale fishing is much lower, smaller than the footprint of industrial vessels, but we should still care about that. But it is important to separate drivers first. The way that we, I would say, punish or sanction the industrial fleet should not be reflected on the artisanal sector at all because the footprint is different, the capacity of doing so is different, the drivers are different, and the impact of such sanctions on a small-scale fisherman are going to be much different than the same sanction on an industrial vessel. If you find a small-scale fisherman $1,000, the repercussions of that $1,000 are going to be huge as opposed to, say, $300,000 for an industrial company that might be nothing, you know, for them. That was Tahia Belhabib of Eco-Justice Canada speaking to us from Vancouver. So that's the situation on the high seas. And that's the problem with squid. Squid move in and out of countries' waters and the high seas, making it much harder to protect them from overfishing. When it comes to industrial fleets who flout good fishing practices, this is a perpetual cat and mouse game. And though organizations like Sea Shepherd, Global Fishing Watch, and World Wildlife Fund are doing their best to assist law enforcement, the underlying issue remains. The financial rewards of overfishing or illegal fishing are simply too high and the penalties are too low. And for decades, the rules have been structured to benefit commerce, not sustainability. Overfishing is bad for everyone, obviously marine life, but also for artisanal fishers, for governments who are stretched to the limit, and certainly for consumers who want to know that the seafood they eat wasn't produced by slave labor or caught illegally. And yet, trust me, that there's hope. In part five of The Catch, we leave the high seas and go into the room where the world's top diplomats in Manhattan and Geneva are negotiating new laws that could dramatically change global fishing practices. Change sometimes happens with just a few dedicated people or groups that that come together. And so hopefully we're at the right moment in time that we can actually get these global treaties over the finish line because we certainly need them. Time is not on our side. That's next time on The Catch. And that's it for part four of The Catch. Our show is a production of Foreign Policy in partnership with the Walton Family Foundation. Our production team includes Rosie Julin, Rob Sachs, Maria Jimena Aragon, Jimena Ledgard, and Anisa Piseschke. Special thanks to my co-reporter, Simeon Tegel, based in Lima. A big thanks to Teresa Ish, Renu Mittal, and Mark Shields from the Walton Family Foundation for their assistance. 
If you like what you're hearing, please consider leaving a review and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Or head over to foreignpolicy.com, where you can listen to our other podcasts and sign up for our newsletter. The Catch is made possible in part by the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested in smart geopolitical news and analysis from Washington and around the world, please consider subscribing. The Catch listeners can get a 15% discount on their first month or year of access by going to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and using the promo code SQUID at checkout. Thanks for listening. I'm Ruxandra Guidi. See you next week.